Welcome, everybody, to episode 301 of the Extra Podcast. It's a pleasure to be with you again this week. Around the table this week, we have Imran. Hello. Hi. And Jeff. Hi. It's good to have you guys here. I'm a little bit sick, John. Yeah, we can hear that. I apologize if my voice is uh, breaking as I go through this entire episode of Mm -hmm. the Northview Extra Podcast. It's good to have Imran with us today. Yes. That's that's not your name. It's It's Imran. Imran. Thank you. People call you Imran, though, don't they? Yeah, there's only one man named Jeff Buck. (laughs) It's because I I heard one time someone called you Imran, and I started calling you Imran for fun. Oh, no. Because I know your name's not Imran. Imran, where are you from? I'm from Pakistan. Right? Yeah. And Where in Pakistan? Uh, Punjab, a province says Punjab and city got Multan. And you have no idea what that is. No, so I'm just I have no idea. It is, no. it is, yeah. No, somebody's somebody's going to try to Google that yeah, and they're going to so like, Multan, how do exactly. I spell that? Somebody who's yeah. listening though might know. So it's Multan, M-U-L-T-A-N. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So you might say Multan. Give us, Multan. Give us a few, uh, a few... Little little tidbits of information about Imran and and first of all, what do you what is it that you do here at Northview? What is your what is your job uh, title? So my job title is associate pastor of local mission. So I just uh, work. My role is to work with Punjabi <coughs> people and engage and help our church to engage with the Punjabi people in the community. And um, my things about me, I love soccer. Um, and I'm a Barcelona fan, then Man United, now Arsenal, because they suck. Um, well, they, they're, okay. very, they're very uh, poor this <laughs> year. There's no question about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, because they like to be in the fourth place. So yeah. Well, we're gonna, not even going to get that this year, but that's all right. Um, so anyway, that's about me, and I, uh, yeah, I oh. love, so I love soccer. Um, I coach soccer, I play soccer. Um, How many languages do you speak? speak four and a half five i would say okay. i would say four and a half which ones which ones do you speak so punjabi is my first language okay let's let's let let us hear uh you say something kind about john in punjabi kind about john oh, wow <laughs> okay i have to think about that now oh, no uh john changa mundae okay yeah great john's a good guy that's okay. what it said and what's your second language? Uh, what's Urdu? the second one you learned? Urdu? Urdu, yeah. Okay. Can you say uh, something kind about John in Urdu? Kase ho. Yeah, it means how are you. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's Hindi. So Hindi and Urdu are very similar. Um, unless you go into the classical deep, then it just totally... Uh, I, I just can't even understand that half of the time. Right, but conversational. So, conversational is very similar. So, Kase Ho will be same in Hindi as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then what's the fourth? Farsi. Right. Uh, and the half is English. Half is... Yeah, sure, exactly. <laughs> half is English. A little bit. Um see. Oh, that's the, yeah. that's the fifth right there. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Really? Farsi and then English, obviously. Yes, some English. Great, you I'd speak say. lots of English. Which one do you think in? Uh, right now, I think it's probably English, but English, Punjabi and English. Okay. Both. I find Thanks. it more comfortable if I'm talking to someone that I can explain myself better conversation. We're having conversation like in English. So I remember I was talking to my dad once. And uh, his favorite verse was from Psalm 34, and I was trying to say that, but all of a sudden I totally forgot how to say that in Punjabi. So I'm just mumbling now, because it's a lot easier to say in English. Yeah. So anyway, so sometimes it's a challenge, but other times, yeah. Have you found it difficult to learn so many languages? Uh, no, that's because I grew up with three, I think. So I love languages. And how, how did you end up here anyway? Um, so do you know a scholarship called Fulbright Scholarship? I do. It's for smart people. Yeah. So I got Fulbright Scholarship to come so no, to that, the Seriously, States. a lot of Canadians wouldn't know what a yeah, Fulbright I, Scholarship is. I don't is. know what so Fulbright is. So Fulbright Scholarship is given to the people from different countries and you come to United States 
and uh, you go to schools and they pay for all your education, airfare, accommodation, food, every single thing. And the goal of that is to create mutual understanding between two countries. So let's say, I think it's available in Canada as well. So Canada and U.S. U.S. is probably... No, dude, the, yeah. Canada's not as open to people from different <laughs> ethnicities as the U.S. That's is. right. right? Yeah, not at all. Yeah, no, no, no I see all those <laughs> and the robots out there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, uh, that's the scholarship. I got the scholarship and then came to Seattle, went to school there. What school did you attend? I went to Des Moines, a college called Highland Community College okay. by SeaTac Airport. Yeah. Uh, so I went there for a year and then, um, finished schooling in hotel hospitality management. Really? Yes. Hotel hospitality management. That's right. So that means that you were trained to what? To do what? Uh, to work in to a hotel. To be the hotel manager. Hotel manager oh, wow. or event mm. planning, things like that. So I did that. Um, so Why in the world would you choose to be a hotel manager? Because I was uh, the scholarship was there. So a friend of mine comes in. I was working in this uh, Christian discipleship training center in Islamabad. And a friend of mine comes like, hey, this because we had partly part of the place was a guest house as well. So I was a team leader, and I was I would manage the guest house as well, which would fall under hospitality. So the requirement was that you have to have your BA, you have to be working in the field. So I was meeting those requirements, and a friend of mine said, like, hey, you should apply for this scholarship. Now hmm. I no. So I applied, and I got accepted. So praise God for that. That's great. That's amazing. Yeah. So I loved it. So what do you do? Like, so, but... But you're not in Seattle, and you're certainly not managing a hotel. No, I am uh, working in Northview Community Church. Yeah, so how did you end up up here? So when I was finishing uh, my school, I didn't want to go back home because being a Christian, it was hard to get a job. I remember those days when I was back there. Uh, I I remember once I applied for this one job, and... uh, on the resume, so you have to write your religion, so you're Christian or whatever. So I say I'm Christian, and the guy wrote it on the application. And of course, uh, three days later, when the interview list came out, I didn't get called for that. Is that common there? Pretty common. Uh, older people would say that it's not, uh, but behind closed doors, yes. And that's why my dad gave me name Imran as well. All my uncles they have like Daniel, Victor, Wilson, Nathaniel. Emmanuel, Samuel, these are the names of my uncles. And I'm like, why would you give me name Imran? He's like, oh, the reason is like when you grow older, you apply for a job. If it's one of those Western names, you may not get a job and your resume will be in the trash. And mm. of course that happens anyway, because what's your last name? Daniel. Who would get, who would get, uh, what, what religious tradition is more? Islam. Islam. So yeah, if you're Muslim. Predominantly, yeah. yeah. It's Muslim. So, yeah. Anyway, so I was working, um, so I was towards my end of my school, and then I didn't want to go back home, and I, a friend of mine, they were my host family at the time, because part of the program was that I had to be with the host family for six months. So, so we're talking, and he told me that in 2010, they have Olympics in Vancouver. You're just finishing the school. You speak few languages. And you're really good at the bobsled. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you said, cool running. I can yeah. go down the That's hill right. fast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was the reason. They're like, go apply for a job and you may get that. So I came here, got a job in the hotel. Really? Which yeah. one? Pacific Palisades Hotel on Robson Street. Really? It doesn't exist anymore because they converted into condos now. Really? Apparently. After yeah. you were there? They uh, said no, this three, isn't worth doing Three years it. later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and then I worked at uh, Terminal City Club in Vancouver, too. I don't know where that is. It's just like the private rich people's club where you have membership and get all the benefits and stuff. Wow. Um, so I worked there for about, yeah, a few months. And, and then you ended up coming to church here. And, and yeah, so I ended up coming. So I met my wife, Suzanne, uh, yeah. and then she told me the, uh, about the internship program. And then I applied for the internship because I always wanted to do this. Yeah. Um, my parents wanted me to be a pastor. I'm like, oh, yeah. not really, not at this point. Uh, but and here you are. Here I am. So yeah. And you're doing uh, your studies through uh, the Immerse program at... Uh, at, at uh, Northview, through yeah. Northview, yeah, to, uh, through uh, Northwest Baptist. That's great. Yeah, so 
Well, it's good, good time. Have, it's good to have you here, Imran. Thank you, Dr. Buckman. It's nice to have somebody add a little bit of culture to this, this mix. And yeah, color to it, yeah. Well, we had a question come in over the last week or so about uh, something that was mentioned in the sermon that Jeff preached at Easter regarding cremation versus natural death and decay. So burial versus cremation. And so mm. they were... Can we be clear? I didn't mention anything about cremation. Okay. In my Easter sermon. All right. I don't but I can that. see how somebody might make a connection between what I said in my Easter sermon about the future of uh, the Christian hope being the redemption of our bodies, right. the physical body, hmm. and the practice of cremation. Mm-hmm. So, this, so is, this is a connecting dot that somebody yep, made. Connecting. So cremation and decay, and just wondering <coughs> that they're coming at it from as a scientist and saying, okay, so on a molecular and chemical level, they're not saying it it really matters to God how the physical material body decays. So how how would you respond to that versus, so cremation versus burial versus, you know? No, I I agree. I, listen, if somebody gets cremated and their, their ashes are spread (laughs) upon the sea. Yeah. I don't think God has any trouble at all in reconstituting the, the physical body. Um, I will say this, the, the question I would have about cremation and it's, listen, I, I do, I do believe this is in the, this is in the Christian freedom category. I don't think that there's a, I don't think there's, there's a, a verse or passage of scripture that I can point to and say, you shall bury your, what about, uh, Genesis? Well, there's some passage descriptions yeah. about how, how, uh, the bones of different, uh, patriarchs and stuff are carried to places and those sorts of things. Yeah. But I don't. I don't think, um, I just don't think that, uh, somebody who has a Christian worldview would, would come to the conclusion that cremation is the way one would bury or one would deal with the the dead Hmm. in, in a Christian worldview. And here's what, here's what I mean by that, that if, if the human body is so central, is so central to what the to, to the future hope and it's uh, loved by God and made by God and redeemed by God ultimately. Uh, and, and, and you have the right conception of the Christian future, that there's a new heaven, a new earth that's going to be physical, all that kind of stuff. I, I just don't understand cremation as a, as an act that you would do to that body afterwards. Can you do it? Yeah. Is it a sin? I don't think so. But at the same, and I know why is it that people do it now? Well, probably because of finance, I think more than anything else. But uh, cremation fits way better with like a, uh, um, it fits way better with the, with like a Buddhist worldview, I would think, or uh, something where, where the material body is something you're trying to kind of get away from and Mm -hmm. it's a prison and uh, the great hope for the future is that you become one with the, with, with the eternal nothingness. Right. I don't know, Imran, you come See, from a culture for, that yeah. actually does cremate. No, we don't. Uh, it's in Indian culture and in Hindu and Sikh culture, yes. But in Pakistan, for us, and at least that's what I grew up with, you just you don't do cremation. You, uh, you bury people. Uh, and I was talking to John earlier because I, I find a bit strange um, the idea of cremating someone who you had a relationship with, and now they're dead. Of, of course, culturally, here we think like, well, they did, they're dead, they're gone. But at one point, I had a relationship with that person. So I, the idea of just lighting them to fire, mm. it just does not sit well with me. Because when I, so I remember like when my mom passed away, so, or any funeral, you basically read a verse, the dust you, you are and dust you return to. So yeah. I'm like, okay, so... That's we are at the end. So why would well, you... Well, eventually you, your body will decompose. Right, yeah. 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 So I, I don't know. For me, um, burial, um, I, I would be more comfortable burying someone rather than cremating. Sure. Um, so, mm-hmm. and, and that's just like the culture of bringing. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I, yeah. What I'm saying, I think, is that <clears throat> even the way that we bury our dead is driven by a certain kind of philosophy or worldview and i'm saying that if you have a christian worldview that has such a high value in in the the resurrection hope of the body 
if you read through the entire biblical story, you would come to the end and you would come to the, you know, in a vacuum, Mm -hmm. you would come to the end and think, okay, so when somebody dies and you were faced with the question, when somebody dies, what, what do we do with them? I don't think cremation would be anywhere in your mind. That again, doesn't mean that you can't do that. It doesn't mean it's a sin to do that. I'm just saying that the natural outgrowth of the Christian worldview would be that you're going to bury them. Yeah. Um, Funny story, by the way. It's a friend of mine um, in Seattle. <coughs> yeah, her uh, mom died, and they did cremation. And uh, so after the cremation, she's bringing the ashes home in Seattle, of course. Yep. Bad traffic, and she wanted to move into the HOE lane, but it has to be two people in and so it. she put the little... <laughs> so she's like on Facebook posting this. Would it be bad... If I go into HOV lane, does my mom's ashes consider the second person? <laughs> oh, that, that was oh, funny. Right. Um, th- yeah, so we're we're basically saying it's a it's a Christian freedom issue, but we should think long and hard about what it is that we are, what it is that we are doing, and why we are doing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna. We're going to ask another quick question about um, about Easter. We had a, uh, a congregant in our church visit another church over Easter weekend, and she just had a quick question about something that was talked about. She um, had the pastor make a comment about Psalm 22, where Jesus on the cross says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the... The church she was visiting, the pastor was making the comment that this is not Jesus saying that God has forsaken him. He's just trying to remind them of this popular psalm so that they might be able to keep it in their their head as they are seeing him hang on the cross and eventually die. Hmm. And so just want to get your, your thoughts on that. She had some kind of mm, questions about whether or not that's yeah. accurate or, or even true to the biblical record. Well, I mean, uh, so if, if what she's described as what her pastor has said, I, I, I disagree. Um, there is some discussion as to what portion of Psalm 22 Jesus is referring to when he talks about, when he, when he, when he quotes, why, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God. Because at the end of the Psalm, um, um, it, it promises, um, so the end of the Psalms, verse 29 of Psalm 22, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. It's a Psalm 22 is at the end is a, is a victory, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's some question as to what, you know, what is Jesus actually appealing to in Psalm 22? Is it the turning away and the cry from the beginning? My God, my God, why have you mm-hmm. forsaken me? It, or is he, by quoting the beginning of Psalm 22, trying to bring everybody's mind to think about the whole of the psalm, which has both this element of why have you forsaken me and a view toward the, the, the victory of God? I, I, I'm okay with both of those. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, if you want to say, yeah, he's just citing the first verse of Psalm 22 because he's trying to talk about how God has turned away in some sense from him relationally, or he's doing that and including it as part of a, and thinking about the great victory that will be won through this act, then I, I'm okay with that. Those are, those. Are, so my, my point here is that there is a legitimate discussion going on with what Jesus has to say there. If mm-hmm. though you're saying... That no, no, Jesus wasn't, the, the father did not in any way condemn the son or didn't in any way um, forsake the son. I think that's where this question is going is then, that that's what the Which is a popular saying. viewpoint that some people want to say. So they want to say, no, this is a psalm about victory only and not the forsaking. I, that's not true. The language of the psalm is not, that's not true to the full language of the psalm. And certainly not true of the vet portion that Jesus quoted. And certainly not true of the context of the gospels. Where Jesus is praying prayers like, um, let this cup pass from me. What is right. he referring to when he talks about this cup? And if you look through the Old Testament, you find that this language of a cup is a, 
it, it has to do with the wrath of God. It's the cup of God's wrath coming on the day of judgment. Mm-hmm. So the idea of God bringing judgment upon sin is all through the end of these, uh, you know, Jesus prays that in the garden of Gethsemane. He's, he's, he knows what he's facing. Not my will, but yours be done. I know he knows that it's the cup of God's wrath that he's going to have to face when he goes there. And that that wrath is displayed in the forsaking of his son to sin in a relational sense. Yeah. I wouldn't say an ontological sense in the sense that the, the father turns away from the son in a, but he's still the Trinity, right? He doesn't cease to be the Trinity on the cross. But there is a sense in, of relational discord, yeah. which is re- remarkable that the Son would suffer that for us. I think that does the most justice to the way the passages, that passage, Psalm 22, is used in the Gospels. And I think it's done, it, it does the most justice to the fact that Jesus quotes the very beginning of it as a cry from the cross that he points to when he talks about this cup in the Garden of Gethsemane and what's going to happen there. So Isaiah 53, too, by the way, talks about what goes on the cross, right? It was, yep. a, it, you know, he was, it, it, it uses language that's, uh, that talks about forsaking. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the, the question that comes up is, is it really a big deal, though, that, that somebody might remove that aspect of what Jesus did on the cross from, from that understanding? Well, people want to turn God into a God who doesn't ex- who doesn't express what we call retributive justice anymore. All of God's justice is restorative, is what they want to say. Do you do you understand what I mean by that? Like, uh, I I do, but maybe try to explain okay. that for some of our okay. listeners okay. who might not. So, like, um, restorative justice is always looking to the to the person who has done who's the wrongdoer and seeking to restore them to full health. All right. Right. Retributive justice is um, when, when God retributes. So you have broken a law or you have broken some commandment and that God and, and that the just response is f- for you to be punished in response to that action. That that's justice is that there will be retribution. People are really uncomfortable these days with retributive justice. That idea that God, they, I like the idea of God being a God who is always trying to restore individuals back to health, which, by the way, is not untrue. God does seek to restore people all the time. The, que- the question is, does God at any point um, in regards to, sw- to sin uh, execute a retributive justice? And the answer, of course, has to be yes. The doctrine of, doctrine of hell is, is that unless you're a universalist of some variety and you believe in restorative justice, meaning everybody who goes is judged ultimately will be restored to some sort of place in uh, heavenly bliss. So that's sort of a purgatorial thing. And Rob Bell wrote a book a number of years ago that kind of following that down. God is only a God of restorative justice. Therefore, there are some people who are going to die and they're going to be on his bad side, but he will always seek to kind of redeem them and bring them to and restore them to the truth. And eventually, because God is God and he's got a long time in eternity, love will win, right? That's the idea. So, like, so, but it's all built on this idea of restorative justice. Uh, but the scriptures talk about retributive justice. I mean, this is what happens when you look at Achan in the Old Testament. Uh, this is what happens. Uh, in fact, in Romans twelve, uh, it says that um, it, it's, it says that you should not, uh, you know, you should not seek to to um, to return uh, harm to somebody, but you should love them instead, and you should leave it to the wrath of God. Right. For it's mine to repay, says the Lord. Right. So in other words, my peacemaking with other people and my willingness to get along or to not seek revenge in Romans 12 finds its basis in God's retributive justice that God, God will actually judge. God will seek retribution in those places. There's lots and lots of examples in scripture of retributive justice, lots and lots of them. And and unfortunately what's gone on with a lot of these folks is they've tried to go back across the scriptures and then try to over you know, read back into those things. Something like this saying, well, Jesus was always a one of, he was always trying to restore everybody. And since Jesus is the fullest picture of who God is, uh, those previous kind of iterations or pictures of God as not being someone who is restoring, but being retributive, must not be true, right? Or, or Joshua, for example, when he when he represents the retributive justice of God against the Canaanites, 
he just misunderstood God because, uh, because the real God is like Jesus who's always restorative. So this is a huge issue these days. And it really mm. is a dividing line, quite honestly, between what is commonly called liberal theology and the more orthodox variety, which I would certainly espouse. Mm. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to this distinction between retributive and restorative justice. I hope, I hope I've explained it so it gets a little bit detailed, but I think I've explained it in some to some degree. I think you have. Um, so, But I guess ultimately it comes down to how, how you're going to read your Bible, right? Doesn't it? Well, you have to, you know, if you want to read the, if you want to read the scriptures to be uh, adhering to only restorative justice and not retributive justice at any point, because I believe in both, right? I believe that mm-hmm. God actually restores through retribution, right? That's what I think happened at the cross, that Jesus actually was, God re- retributed the just judgment on him so that he might restore all those who by faith believe in him. So, so if you believe in just one of those, meaning you only believe in restorative justice, man, there's a whole lot of Bible that you got to get, get, get around now. Mm-hmm. And the way you do that is that you, like I said, you make some clever argument about how, well, Joshua just got it wrong or, or you end up saying that, they, you know, there's a book out recently, it's called a more Christ-like God. You end up, you end up saying, well, no, that, that, that God of the old Testament, he's different than the God of the new, which is sort of a Marcionite heresy that went on years ago, that the God of the old Testament, and new Testament are very different. Uh, but that's very popular these days. Lots and lots of people don't like the old Testament God. In fact, I'm teaching, well, a class right now that's called Knowing God in the Old Testament. That's right, yeah. With Imran's in it, and and so are you, John. And and that's part of what we're talking about in it, is that the God of the Old Testament is like, there are books written called God Behaving Badly, and it's based upon what God does in the Old Testament, as if there's some sort of moral framework that we have now that we can judge this Old Testament God by. He's a bad guy, this this Old Testament God, because we know better now. And so some people want to hold up. A lot of people will say, well, that's why the Bible's rubbish and meaningless, right? Because we know better now. We have a better, we have a better um, morality than the Bible has. But some people want to still hold on to the Bible and still hold that viewpoint, right? right. So what do you do? Well, you, you kind of have to read over the Bible. You have to figure out how you can do away or explain away some of these retributive justice passages, which are so many, so many. Yeah. Yeah. So w- w- would you say because we live in a culture that is feel good, right? And that's why we're just going to have a hard time kind of like, no, God of the Old Testament is a cruel God or um, hater or however you just describe that, right? Yeah. Just because culturally that we just want him to be the way we just always thought or saw in movies per- perhaps yeah, right. as well, right? Well, we we want to make God in our own image yeah. and then cut off the edges that we don't like when we see something that we disagree with. Right. But you have to understand why it is that we tend to disagree with it. It sounds, it sounds mean. We bring our children up to be nice to everybody and there's good, you know, and there is half theological truths and everything, right? That the people who uh, God judges are made in his image and uh, he is delighted with them. He loves them, these sorts of things. Right. So why would God retribute against somebody? Then why would he restore others? Right. There's all sorts of theological questions that go into this. Also, I mean, in our culture, Imran, we, in, in the modern Western world, the distance that I have from seeing genuine violence and evil, it, I mean, there's a huge distance between me and that now. Mm-hmm. Whereas in ages past, that's not the case. I mean, people who live in other parts of the world, as you well know, uh, you know, see, seeing somebody beat to death, right? seeing somebody uh, shot to death, uh, hacked up, S- seeing um, these horrible things happen in front of their eyes is I mean, a, a reality for them. And retribution for them is, uh, they're, they're dealing with a question, God, how, how am I supposed to live in a world where this person's gotten off scot right. free and and a passage like Romans 12 is is salve to them there's it's saying listen you don't need to seek revenge 
It's mine. You can leave it to the Lord and he, and he will avenge. Mm-hmm. Meaning that he will retribute. So you can live at peace with that person knowing that there is a final judgment where that person's actually going to have to give an answer. And so you can live in peace in that thing. We don't feel the, we don't feel aggrieved on that level. We feel emotionally aggrieved. feel like people wrong us and that sort of stuff or maybe financially aggrieved in this place or another. But we largely live in societies that are governed by many Christian principles and our finances and governments kind of operate by some good common grace rules. Uh, and as a result, um, we don't we don't see it. We don't feel it quite as pointedly as people in other parts of the world. And so, which is why, you know, if as we're here, he and I have talked about this several times. You know, people in his village in Africa don't have any trouble at all with the retributive justice of God. Mm-hmm. They don't have any trouble at all with it. They think that evil should be retributed. There, there should be retribution on evil and right. on, on those who perpetrate it. Um, we we don't because we think everybody's nice. Uh, we don't see people behind the closed doors. We don't see what's going on in their hearts. We don't see what kind of evils that they're involved in and things like that. But because everybody's got a pretty good, nice face, we think that everybody should be restored and everything's good and whatever. Right. It's a long, good discussion to have about this. And the problem is it's not totally either or, right? Yeah, God does yeah. restore and he retributes. Mm-hmm. Yes, he does. It was interesting as you were talking about some of that, that uh, the violence that we witness almost third party through different clips or whatever else. There's a, there's a small part of me that's like, well, you, you can't really talk about that out loud. Like it just, it, it eats at at least my sensibilities of like, oh, that's no, just hide that, sweep it under the rug a little bit. You mean the parts of the Bible that talk about God's? No, the, as you were talking about the, the kinds of violence that people experience oh. in overseas or out, out in different worlds. Right. And we kind of want to, we, we want to see it a little bit because we, we want to make sure that we know what's going on, but we really don't want to deal with it because we don't really know how to deal with it. Yeah. Well, it's a blessing. First of all, I'm totally, I am totally for nonviolence and being separated from violence and being in societies. And I actually think that's the way the world ought to work and will one day completely work. There will be not violence. We'll have full shalom. Yeah. Um, the problem is in the fallen world is that uh, there is a lot of it. And in some sense in the Western world, and especially in suburban settings in the Western world, we have been able to insulate ourselves a great deal from it so that we end up growing up as children thinking to ourselves that it's, it's so rare violence. It's mm-hmm. so rare, 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 which is wonder. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It is. And yet it's not true. It's not really true. Right. That's why when kids go away to places like Thailand and others, they see, and you know, and, and, and Pakistan and other places like that. And they see actual violence, go to Detroit and see actual violence. Yeah. They, they're shocked. They see the slums and they see the kinds of oppressive situations that people are living in. And they're absolutely overwhelmed because they're like, Oh my, it's so different than the common grace that they've experienced in their whole lives, which mm-hmm. they should be thankful for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the real world and the real world that's exist exists for most people in the world and the real world that exists is for most of time you know, it's not uncommon for somebody who's a, a kid to see their dead, some, somebody, a dead body in at early days. Uh, but we're separated from death. We're separated from violence. We're separated from all of the dirty parts of the society so that we end up thinking that, well, everybody's clean and everything's good and whatever. And so when the Bible calls us things, says things like, I heard about a lady recently who was getting upset because the Bible says that we're wretches. Or the mm-hmm. song, you know, um, sorry, Amazing Grace, how yeah. sweet this sounds, saved a wretch like me. Well, that's not true. We're not wretches. Well, it's partly not true in the sense that God made us as as in his image and we are beautifully and masterfully made and he knits us together in our mother's womb. Right. That's absolutely true. He, we are a masterpiece in his mind, made specially for his pleasure. And yet we're totally fallen wretches yeah. <laughs> and both are true. Right. Do you know what I mean? And good yeah. theology holds both those together and recognizes that you know, there's this problem of sin that needs to be dealt with and that God in, in his love for us has done so with Christ on the cross and that he has retributed the just punishment on it so that he might restore those who believe in him. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. Well, we are going to close off our podcast there for the day. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, you can email those into extra at northview.org or you can visit our Facebook page, Northview Extra, on Facebook and send your questions in there. We'd love to hear from you and what you're thinking about and what you got questions about. Thanks for listening. Have a good week. Mm